this morning. We could buy use that at some point.
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Again, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Amen. Praise God. Uh, welcome this morning. I don't see I don't see any new faces. But if you're a new face, welcome to Maranatha Baptist Fellowship. <laughs> it must be a Cowboys game today. <laughs> All right. Do we have any praises this week? Uh, we went on vacation, and then I had surgery, and then I went on vacation again, so we're finally back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did. I did rest. I was going to say, you are gone for like three weeks. It's like, yeah, man. And one less organ. And one less organ. <laughs> got uh, we, we, we've got a couple up here. That, so. <laughs> Keyboard, not organ, but... <laughs> yeah. All right. My brother and sister in law from Houston, they own a cabin in Estes Park, Colorado. Oh. And they happened to be there last week. And uh, they were notified by the sheriff that they needed to get out of there because the roads were crumbling. Their only access were the cabin in. And they got out of there just barely. The roads were deteriorating under their vehicle as they were driving off. Wow. And they, they got out of there, and we weren't we didn't hear from them for quite a while, so we were kind of concerned about them because we didn't we didn't know what you know, specifically what was going on with the flooding or anything. But uh, anyway, they're back they're back in Texas. They got back there this morning. So well, praise God, they were safe. Amen. That that that. Uh, that rain in, in Colorado, uh, I've got some old high school friends that live there, and, and the pictures they posted are just, it, yeah. Uh, my mother-in-law has a co-worker that woke up uh, one morning, I think it was Thursday. Uh, she woke up and, and called work and said, I'm going to wait until it's daylight because of all the rain and the, the, you know, the chance for flooding that they've been talking about. So she waited until daylight. And she looked outside, and water was clear up to her house. And there had been, and I stress had been, a, a trailer home park across the street from her. She said it was it was gone. There was not there was nothing there. It was it was already just washed away. Um, so, um, you know, we we have a praise that uh, Jenny's mom was far enough away that. Uh, the, they were not affected, and she said the water's starting to go down now. So, praise God. Be in prayer for the ones that have lost their homes and loved ones, though, because it, it was devastating. Any other praises this week? A lot of people know what Facebook is. Okay? <laughs> Everybody pretty much knows. It. We don't use it. I don't use it. But anyway. <laughs> Since then, 
Jesus over the internet or on Facebook. If that one game and that one website only brought just one person to God, which I know it hasn't, it's got to have many more, but if it only did the one, then I see the good, and God can use whatever he wants to for his good. So I'm praising God that a young woman that that through her tragedy, I was able to bring her to other friends of mine on the internet, and now she is going to grow and know that she is born again, saved through the grace of God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. It is a praise. We have a new cousin. You have a new cousin. That's right. Savannah, well, she was born Wednesday at 1240, 7 pounds and 20 inches long. That was a long little girl. So, praise God. Babies! <laughs> They had a toddler. They didn't have a baby. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God for your, your principal. All right. Any other praises? All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh. Oh. Those that spider bites are just, they're horrible. Yeah. And, and not to be, well, no, I won't ask that. You never ask a woman's age. I was going to ask how old your mom, mother-in-law was, but she's elderly and a spider bite on her hand. She's was older. Uh, older. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, oh, she's not that old then. Yeah, I'm almost... Hey, Pastor, to, maybe, maybe I, we should just pray and continue. That's a good idea. Let, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Please, Lord, forgive me for Sean, indiscretions. Oh. Speaking of elderly, we'll be married 35 years tomorrow. Holy Ooh. <laughs> Praise God. 35 years. <laughs> yeah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that uh, not only uh, do we get to be here on, on Sunday morning to praise and worship you and glorify your name, but we get to do it and have fun too. Lord, I just thank you for everybody that's here this morning. I thank you for the many praises. I thank you for the, uh, the safety that you've provided those in Colorado who have, who have gotten safety. Lord, I also pray for those uh, who didn't receive the safety. Uh, Lord, that maybe have lost their homes, have lost their uh, loved ones. Lord, I just pray that you would help bring the pieces back together and help help bring people into their lives, Christians into their lives that will help them rebuild, that will help uh, witness to them, that will help show them the hope that can be found in Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for Lahana and her her uh, willingness to, to share Christ with others. And I thank you uh, for that obedience. And I thank you also for the one that came to know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, we just ask that you would be with her and to help her to, to start growing in Christ and surround herself with people who will help uh, uplift her and help her uh, be discipled as she learns to follow you. Lord, be with us this morning as we continue to praise and worship your name and study your word. These things we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. All right. Uh, most of you know the story of Job. Um, in chapter 1 of Job, he has a lot, has a happy family, trusts in God, and then he loses it all. <clears throat> um, this morning as we prepare ourselves for worship, uh, we wanted to bring this verse to <clears throat> to you uh, to help prepare your heart. Uh, it's Job chapter 1, verse 21. And Job said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. That is so true this morning. Let's actually stand. Uh, this church, as you know, as Sean has been talking about the last few weeks, has been under attack. And uh, the Lord really has given and taken away in those times. But the truth is we all go through battles. We all face different 
trials uh, of various kinds as James talks about but he gives us joy and he will walk through us with the battle and this song we'll talk about it's an oldie but a goodie so uh. in heaven the armor will enter the land the battle belongs to the Lord no weapon that's fashioned against us will stand the battle belongs to the Lord and we sing glory
1 John 5, um, 1, 5, excuse me. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Father, I I thank you for your amazing grace. I thank you that you've given us 10,000 reasons to sing and that we can bless your name. Lord, I thank you that you go with us through the battles and that you are greater than anything that we have ever come across. That you are with us that you are for us and nothing can be against us and that, Lord, you give and you take away. Lord, all these things, it is all about you, Lord, not about us. It's about what you can do for us and what we can do to serve you. In Jesus' name I pray. 
Amen. First-time church visitors come because someone personally invited them. All people need to feel loved and wanted, and for some people, it just takes having someone offer to give them a ride to church. We have something great going on at this church. People's lives are being transformed by God's love. Your homework this week is to find at least one person who could use a little more of that love and invite them to come with you next week. Trust me, it's worth the extra effort. Mrs. Edwards, you want to listen to some music on the way? Go ahead, your choice. <sighs> okay, here we are. It is so important that we invite people to church. Um, that's why I'm where I'm at. God used an invitation to church from my mother, and that's why I started going to church. Had it not been for an invitation, I may not be here. <laughs> you might be sitting there thinking, that'd be a good thing. <laughs> but, I mean, seriously, um, when, when we meet people where we're at, in the store at the meat market. I, I, I met Lahana at the meat market, in, at the apple market in, uh, in Auburn. And, and we were both complaining about the price of meat. <laughs> and I said, oh, she, I said, we've started raising chickens because it's so, so expensive. And she said, really? She said, we raise chickens? And I said, yeah. She said, do you have any roosters? And I said, no. She said, ah, would you like one? <laughs> so uh, that's, that's how the conversation started out. And invited her to church, and here they are. I mean, and, and they have since invited friends. It takes invitations for people. People don't know that they're necessarily welcome at a church if we don't let them know they're welcome at the church. Um, like they said, 80% of first-time churchgoers, the reason they go, because somebody invited them. So let's invite people to share with us as we praise and worship the Lord. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. I love that. Uh, but anyway, today we're back into the Gospel of John. Uh, we've taken uh, several weeks off from the, chap uh, from, from the Gospel of John. We're back in chapter 6. But since we've taken kind of like a break, I'm going to bring us back up and give us a quick refresher. Chapter 6 started with another miracle of Jesus. It started out with crowds following him because of the wonders that he had been doing. And th there was a large crowd, 
numbering 5,000 men. So you had uh, at least 5,000, and, and it's more than likely 15 to 20,000 by the time you count the women and the children. So a large crowd was following him. And Jesus put his disciples to a test, basically. And, and they were at a total loss. They had no idea how they were going to feed this many people. In fact, it was suggested, let's send them on their way. In other words, let them go get their own food and not worry about it. But then you've got Andrew. Remember Andrew, I, I, I've said in the past that every time Andrew's mentioned, he's bringing somebody to Jesus, and we need to be more like Andrew. We need to be a church full of Andrews. Andrew brings this boy with five loaves and two fish, and, and, which is a good start because that's close to what Jesus was thinking. We're going to feed these people. But then his faith kind of waned, and he said, but what are these for so many? But remember, I said oftentimes when God tests us, he tests us just beyond where our faith is at. And he does that for a reason. Because when we see the issue resolved or the, the test, we come through, um, we know that it wasn't on our own doing. It had to have been of God, and that helps stretch our faith further. When we come out of our tests and our trials, we see that God has been at work, and now our faith is further than where it used to be. Our belief in the promises of God are stronger than they were before. And our focus is more on Him than ever. So after Jesus performs His creative miracle, creating more bread and, and fish for everybody to eat as much as they wanted, um, He ordered the disciples to get into the boat and leave. And the reason He did this is because the, the crowd they were starting to get this mob mentality. We're going to take Jesus and we're going to make him our king. So Jesus protected his disciples from that and told them to leave. And then he himself withdrew and went and prayed, untouched by the crowd. Then the next week we saw yet another miracle of Jesus. The disciples had gone as Jesus directed them, and they were on the Sea of Galilee heading to uh, to Capernaum, and all of a sudden a storm came up, and the disciples had to fight against it, and they fought the storm for a minimum of six hours, because it said it was evening, but it was dark, so you're guessing about 9 p.m., and then by the time they saw Jesus, uh, it says it was the fourth watch, which would be sometime between three and six, so for, from nine till at least three, they were fighting these, these horrible waves and the storm. And Jesus came walking toward them on the water, and they took him into the boat. And instantly, the storm was calmed, and they were at their destination. So actually, Jesus did like three miracles all in one. One, he walked on water. That's just not possible, unless you're God. When he stepped into the boat, the storm was calmed. So the, the, the storms obey Jesus Christ, because the storms have to obey the word of God. And... Lastly, their boat was immediately at their destination. And I think that's something when we just blaze, blaze through this passage, oftentimes gets overlooked. They could have been several miles from their destination, yet instantly they were there. And then the next morning, the crowds were searching for Jesus because they saw the disciples leave, and they never saw Jesus get up and walk anywhere, yet he was gone. So they went and started seeking him in, uh, to, to Capernaum. And I discussed that there were two types of people, and, and there still are two types of people seeking Jesus. There are those who seek Jesus because of what he can give them uh, to make their life easier. He can provide them with food to eat, such as he did these people. He can heal their ailments, such as he did these people. He could get them out of Roman rule, which is what these people wanted. Um, in other words, uh, there are those who seek him for health, wealth, and prosperity. The second group of people seek him because they recognize him for who he is, God in the flesh. They seek him not for his wonders, but because of who he is and the forgiveness that he can provide. Amen. I then ask the question, um, why do you follow Christ? Is it because of what he can do for you, a.k.a. life enhancement, or is it because of what he's already done for you? He went to the cross, dying for your sins, and giving you eternal life. 
At the end of the passage, Jesus tells them that they, they should be seeking the food uh, that endures to eternal life, which, is, which he is able to give them. Jesus tells them that the work that endures to eternal life is to believe in him whom God has sent. In other words, believe in Jesus himself. As we continued on from there today, we're going to be taking a look at verses 30 through 50 of John chapter 6. And we're going to see three phases to this passage. We're going to see real manna. We're going to see real mis misunderstanding. And we're going to see real murmuring. So if you, if you haven't already, turn in your Bibles with me uh, to John chapter 6 as I read verses 30 through 50. John 6, 30 says, So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, there's that truly, truly again. Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of the Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him, because he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who, who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who comes from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. So as we, as we break this passage open, I'm going to go back two verses, and I'm going to go ahead and reread verses 28 and 29 from the previous time we were here. It says, Then they said to him, what, what, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. These people want to know what they need to be doing to be doing the works of, of God. And, and he basically tells them, Believe on me. And, and, and then how do they respond? That's where we pick up today. They say, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate man in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Okay? Um, is it just me or are these people extremely dense? I mean, the day before, they just watched him feed a huge multitude of people with only five barley loaves and two fish. Then this morning they wake up expecting to see Jesus and he's not there and nobody can explain where he's gone or how he is now at a synagogue in Capernaum preaching. So two miracles right in front of them and they say, what sign do you do that we may see and believe? What work do you perform? Are you kidding me? 
Um, Jesus has just been healing the sick, feeding the hungry, teaching throughout the countryside, and these people trying to compare that, what they've just seen, with their fathers from generations past eating manna in the wilderness. Um, I mean, that, it's just ridiculous. Now, earlier I asked if these people were dense, and the answer is no. They're wicked. Um, just like we were before we saw Christ for who he really was, or is. Uh, John Calvin, he, he made a statement. John Calvin said, quote, This wicked question clearly shows the truth of what is said elsewhere. A wicked and adulterous generation asks for miraculous signs. Matthew 12, 39. A wicked and adulterous generation asks for miraculous signs. So it's not that they're dense. It's that they're wicked. Their hearts are hardened and they can't see what God is trying to reveal to them. These people had, had witnessed far more than ample evidence of Jesus' deity, but they wanted to, a repeat performance of yesterday. Um, they were fed dinner last night, and they're here this morning begging for breakfast, is basically what the deal is. But Jesus quickly corrects their understanding of the manna from heaven. And he starts off by saying, yet again, truly, truly, I say to you. In other words, he's saying, listen up, people. I'm going to say something, and it's really important that you get and listen to what I'm saying. He says, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus is, is rebuking them, and he's telling them, I'm the real manna. I'm the bread of God who comes down from heaven to give life to the world. Um, Jesus wasn't the same as the manna that the fathers ate. That bread, it gave physical life, but that was it. Jesus is the real manna. But next, we're going to see their real misunderstanding so Jesus tries to explain to them that he's the real manna, and they, they respond. They said to him, Sir, give us that bread always. Now, this comment shows their real misunderstanding. Um, just like we've seen in the past, when Jesus speaks, he often speaks in a spiritual sense, and he's misunderstood by the people listening, and they take it in a physical manner. Um, they want, an unending, they want an unending supply of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They're expecting Jesus to say, come and check out the Jesus All Day Diner opening soon in a town near you. They want food. It's an all-you-can-eat buffet with Jesus. Because the previous day, they ate until they were all filled. And then food was collected back up. So surely he's got leftovers for the breakfast this morning. But Jesus, like I said, he had just corrected their understanding of the manna from heaven, and he did it in four areas. First, the understanding that it wasn't Moses who gave them the manna. That's right. The bread from heaven came from God the Father. Moses just gave instruction on how the manna was to be collected, eaten, and, and whatnot. He just gave God's direction. God gave the bread from heaven. Secondly, manna was not the true bread from heaven. It was only bread from heaven. Okay. Jesus said in verse 3, My Father gives you the true bread. And that, that word gives, it is a, a, it's a present tense verb. It's, it's happening right now as we speak. My Father gives you the true bread. And that word true means genuine or real. Like I said, Jesus is the real manna. Thirdly, the manna that gave, phys it gave physical life, like I said before, but the bread of God which comes down from heaven gives spiritual life. All throughout John's gospel, he uses the word zoe, uh, which is translated life, but it gives the meaning, the full meaning of uh, spiritual and eternal life, not just physical life. And finally, unlike the manna which was given only to Israel in the desert when they were in their wanderings, the true bread is for the whole world. 
So Jesus continues to try and clarify their, their real misunderstanding by explaining further. He says, I am the bread of life. Who comes, uh, whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me amen. but raise it up on the last day. Yes, For this is the will of my Father that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. This, this passage, this section of scripture, it starts out with the words, I am. And everyone present would have recognized that as the name of God. Uh, when Moses asked God uh, at, the, at the burning bush, and, and God is, tells him, you need to go to Egypt, and you need to, to get the people released. and He's like, well, when they ask, who should I tell them is sending me? Exodus 3.14 says, I am who I am. And then he tells Moses, tell them I am has sent me to you. So here he, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And he, there's, there's like 21 or 23 places in, in, in this gospel where it doesn't necessarily say it in that order, I am, but in the Greek it's ego eimi. And he uses that several times, and that's a definite I am statement. But he makes seven I ams in the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life. Or, yeah, I, I am the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I am, I am. And he's got seven huge statements that people cannot misunderstand in, this, in, in the day it was being heard that he is claiming to be God. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And since Jesus is speaking spiritually here, uh, about being bread, he's also speaking of the soul and not the body. Uh, when he declared that those who come to him would never hunger or thirst. In verse 35 gives two simple verbs to explain our part, man's part in salvation. Process, come and believe. Those are the, that's man's part. We're to come and believe. To come to Christ is forsake our sinful nature, to, to forsake our old life of sin and rebellion and submit to him as our Lord. Amen. And John never uses the word repent or repentance in his gospel, but the word come is the same meaning or same idea as repentance. You're to forsake your sin and you're to turn to Jesus. That's what repentance is. It's turning from sin and turning to God. So that's, that's what it means to come. Now to believe in Christ is to trust completely in him as the Messiah and Son of God through faith in him alone. So repentance and faith, have two si they're basically two sides of the same coin. To repent is to turn from the sin and to believe is to turn to the Savior. That it's inseparable. And that is the man's part in the salvation process. We can do nothing. God has done it all by paying the price for our sin on the cross. In verse 36, Jesus rebukes them again for not believing. Um, this isn't the first time that we've seen this. He's rebuked them for not believing in the past. He did it in John chapter 5, verse 38. He said, You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. Ouch. And now he's telling them, I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. He's rebuking them for their disbelief. So even though the crowd isn't getting it, they don't understand, they have huge misunderstandings about who Jesus is, Jesus was still confident in his success of the Father's will. Jesus wasn't scared that he was going to fail in his mission. He had complete confidence that he would succeed in the mission God had sent him to accomplish. Because Jesus continues and tells them, All that the Father gives me will come to me. 
And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should not lose anything of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus knows that all that come to come and believe, the Father has given him. Um, they're, they're basically a love gift from the Father to the Son. And, and Jesus says that he will never cast them out. And that word never, it, in the Greek, it's a... a I guess double negatives in the Greek are a good thing. It's emphasis. Only in English are double negatives bad. <laughs> um, but the word never is a, is a, a double negative in the Greek, and, and it states emphatically that he will not reject anyone who sincerely and submissively comes to him, and he will not cast them out. Amen. Jesus' next statement, verse 38, makes it clear that he came to earth with only one purpose in mind. And that one purpose is to perfectly obey the will of the Father who sent him. The reality that Jesus came to do the will of the Father who sent him, uh, that guarantees the salvation of those who come and believe. Not only does it guarantee the salvation of those who come and believe, but it also guarantees their eternal security. It, it's the Father's will that of all that he gives the Son, the Son should lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. That's what that verse says. Jesus is adamant in this because he states basically the same things worded slightly different four times in just this passage. He says it in verse 39, verse 40, verse 44, and verse 54, which we're not looking at today, but we will next time. So he's adamant. I will raise them up on the last day, whoever the Father gives me. And he declares it in an even more clear fashion in John 10, verses 27 through 30. Um, read that real quick. I didn't write it down. 10, verses 27 through 30. It says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So Jesus is going to raise those who the Father has given him up on the last day. Jesus shared with this crowd a lot of information. Um, and he's once again made himself equal with God. How dare he? He said, I am the bread of life, making himself equal with God, and, and that he was sent down from heaven, and that if they would come and believe in him, the Father would give them to him, and he would never cast them out, um, but give them eternal life and raise them on the last day. So Jesus pointed to himself as being the real manna, and, and he's made several attempts not real successful attempts at, at clarifying their real misunderstanding. But what it led to was real murmuring. Verses 41 through 50 read, So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread of life came, that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say I've come down from heaven? And Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that no one may eat of it and not die. So that one may eat of it and not die. So verse 41 reveals their real murmuring. They say, so 
It says that the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. And, and what did I say? They're not dense. They're wicked. And because of their wicked hearts and unbelief, they still don't understand what Jesus is trying to clarify, what he's, what he's trying to tell them. And, and they begin to grumble against Jesus, uh, just like their ancestors grumbled against God when they were wandering in the desert eating manna. Wow, what a parallel. These same people are grumbling against God again. And they were upset too by two things that Jesus said. First, because he claimed to be the source of eternal life. Only God can do that. How dare he say he's the source of eternal life? And secondly, that he said that he came down from heaven. Isn't this just the son of Joseph, whose mother and father we know? Verse 42, we, we see they only thought that Jesus was a man, the son of Joseph. Um, he was one of them. How can he now say uh, he came down from heaven? He's just a man. And I kind of compare this crowd to the Pharaoh in Egypt. Um, though the Pharaoh saw the signs of God and he heard uh, the words of God spoken through Moses and Aaron, this, the Bible tells us he hardened his heart and wouldn't believe. This crowd has seen the wonders of God that Jesus has been performing. And they've heard him explain numerous times in many different ways, but they've hardened their hearts against their Messiah, who claimed equality with God and required repentance and faith as a requirement for entering heaven. Um, Jesus didn't answer their murmurings and grumblings. Uh, rather, he, he commanded them to stop grumbling. In verse 43, he, he had already shared with them enough that if their hearts weren't hardened, they would have seen him for who he really was. So there was no need to elaborate further. So he basically told them, don't grumble among yourselves. And in verse 44 through 46, Jesus speaks some very intense words about the Father. He says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. So he tells them that no one can come to him unless the Father draws them. The Father has to draw them to Christ. If God did not irresistibly draw sinners to Christ, um, then no one would ever come to him. But thankfully, God does draw sinners to Christ. In Acts 17, verses 30 through 31, it reads, The times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Amen. So God calls sinners, it is his, his call to sinners is his command that all people everywhere should repent. And those who do repent and believe will be raised on the last day. And Jesus says, and they will be taught by God. And this is, this is kind of a paraphrase of Isaiah 54.13. Isaiah 54.13 reads, All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. So he goes on to tell them, uh, Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So basically he's saying to those who have who have heard and learned, but even more than that, have understood. It's one thing to hear, but it's another thing to understand and obey. How many of you, as teenagers, heard the words of your parents, <laughs> but that's about as far as it went? It's, it's, her, it's hearing, it's learning, it's understanding, it's obeying. Um, those who understand, come to me. And we need to be uh, open to being taught by the Lord. 
We need to be in God's word. Um, how else are we to be taught by the Lord? Now, you, you, you can't or you shouldn't um, expect to just come here on Sundays and hear my sermons and, and call that being taught by the Lord because as, as much as I allow God to lead me in the preparation of a sermon and as much as I try and uh, stay true to the text, I'm not the Holy Spirit. Uh, thank God I'm not the Holy Spirit. That's a job I'd, I wouldn't want. I, I do the best that I can with, with, with helping understand God's Word. Um, but you being led by the Spirit in your own study of God's Word will reveal much more if you allow it. Verses 47 through 50 uh, say, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your Father fathers ate the man in the wilderness and they died this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die Amen. Um, now I'm going to back up real quick rabbit trail uh, this morning during Sunday school somebody had mentioned that we need to be more in the word we need to so many of us have gotten and so many preachers have gotten to a point where when they read scripture they don't study scripture it's just scratching the surface. And this person said, I'm not going to name the name because I didn't ask for permission, but the, the, this person said that we need to dig deep into God's word Amen. as individuals and as in corporate worship. So, thank you. He killed the rabbit. Um, back, back to where I was. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. So Jesus is again saying uh, that belief in him leads to eternal life. Because he is the bread that comes down from heaven. Um, eat of this spiritual bread, and you will not die. Now, he then reminds them of, uh, that their fathers who ate the manna in the wilderness, they did die. And, and, and we too will someday physically die. I hate to break that news to you, but the statistics show that 10 out of 10 die. Unless Jesus comes back first. That was actually in my... That's right. Well, th the way the world is, it may not be far. Um, so... This question you have to answer for yourself. Where will, we, where will you be in your belief just before you die? Where are you in your belief now? Because once you die, it's too late to make a decision to come and believe. That's something you have to make today. Will you see Jesus as the real manna? Or are you still hardening your heart, which leads to a real misunderstanding and real murmuring? Only you and God know. But I want to remind you that John's gospel for writing this, John's reason for writing this gospel says, These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So, if you're sitting out here today, I pray that everybody here has that personal relationship with Jesus Christ through repentance and faith. But if you're sitting here today and you do not have that personal relationship, please, please, please consider the things that we've been studying in the Gospel of John. See Jesus Christ for who he really is and put your trust in him. Maybe you have another decision that you need to make. Maybe it's one of uh, church membership. Maybe it's one of uh, ministry. Maybe God is calling you out of your current job into a pastorate. Maybe God is calling you into the mission field. Only you and God know what God is calling you to. to. Be obedient. Be grateful to the God who's given you life and answer that call. So whatever your decision, if you need to come up here uh, and speak to God one-on-one, -on -one, there's a place on either side Come up and pray and listen for the Lord to answer.
Would you join me in prayer, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus' explanation that helps us understand who he truly is. Jesus Christ is the I Am of the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is the God that rescued the Israelites from Egypt. Jesus Christ is the I Am who created this universe that we live in. And Jesus Christ is the one who died for our sins. Lord, I thank you for this passage of Scripture. And I just pray that if anybody here is present and needing to make a decision, regardless of what that decision is, Lord, that you would draw them, as Scripture says, that you would draw them to yourself and that you would call them into obedience. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing a hymn of invitation?